Good morning. Uh, today's scripture is taken from the book of Malachi, chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. I invite you to stand while I read the scripture. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name, but you say, How have you despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, How have we defiled you? In that you say, The table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifices, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you, or would he receive, or would he receive you kindly? Says the Lord of hosts. But now, will you not entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious with us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any, any of you kindly? Says the Lord of hosts. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. For from the rising of the suns, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering that is pure for my name, will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you are profaning it, in that you say, the table of the Lord is defiled, and as for its fruits, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how tiresome is it, and you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, so that so you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and woes it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord, for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. Thank you. As I read through the scriptures, as we read through the scriptures, we see a lot of common experiences. We read about the spiritual experiences that Israel undergoes, and we often see ourselves in those same similar mood swings, emotional swings, spiritual swings. And sometimes what's recorded in Holy Scripture is there for our encouragement. Sometimes what's recorded there in those mood swings, those swings of spiritual devotion, they are there as a warning for us. And one of the disconcerting things that I often see, and I see going on in Malachi in today's reading, is a common cycle of devotion that you and I experience. Surely we do. Sometimes on a weekly basis, maybe a daily basis, but usually it's longer term because there are times, and there have been times, surely in your life as well, where you have been up, spiritually enthusiastic, devout, committed, excited, and your heart belongs to God seriously. And then, as happens so often with Israel, we kind of drift. And other things occupy our minds, and unfortunately, other things occupy our hearts. And though outwardly we remain religious, our heart's not into it. And so it's kind of fake and pretend. We drift off. And uh, not that 
any of us or any of them are disregarding God, they're just not legitimately fully honoring Him as He ought to be honored. And perhaps you can look around and you can say, wow, I see what's going on with Israel here. They are, some of them at least, are religiously devout, but man, God's got all kinds of complaints because they sniff at the Lord's table. They say how tiresome it is. And, and you know, this religion stuff is a bother. And you can see that happening on a national scale as it did with Israel. But then maybe I don't have much to say about the nation. And I need to realize that everything that goes on nationally starts at home. The only one I can change is me, and I need to look at me. Where am I spiritually? Am I high where I am with all of my heart, all of my soul, all my strength honoring God? Or am I drifting and kind of half into it and going through the motions but not really there? Or maybe I've gone farther and I'm not even going through the motions. Maybe I'm disgruntled and say, man, that's a... That's a real pain. That's tiresome. I, I'm not, you know, I got other stuff to do. Where are you? And, and I would suggest, you know, that I don't know that anybody here, I, 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 I'm not reading Malachi with an orientation toward this church or anybody here, but as an encouragement. I, I don't want this to come across wrong, but I, I see going on in Malachi what is so common, and I want us to see these things and make sure we don't slip as Israel slipped, right? I'm not saying anybody has slipped, but just let's, let's don't. Let's look at these things, and let's make sure that we are rendering appropriate honor to God with our lives. Somehow, this passage is directed at the priests. They are the very people who are supposed to know God best. They are supposed to demonstrate God's worthiness and the, the manner of respect and honor that everybody ought to be showing God. And somehow they're the ones who are maybe not really aware. How have we defiled your altar, right? They're asking because they're not aware. And maybe we're not aware because... In the New Testament, we're the priests. And all of these things that are being related in Malachi to the priests, they all have parallels. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a sacrifice, and there's the Lord's table, the fellowship meal. All, all those things, are there, there are parallels in our priestdom. And we are the ones that are supposed to be the light to the world. We are the ones that are supposed to uh, be the go-between between between God and people that don't know God. And so it speaks to us with so many parallels. So as Christians, as those who are supposed to know God and make God known to others, the appeal here is just that we take a look and ensure that our own lives, our own habits, are indeed bringing appropriate honor to God. As the Lord indicates... In chapter 1, and starting at, at, at verse 6, the actions and attitudes of those people who are representative of him, Christians, ought to demonstrate a reverential respect, an honor, a reverence. And I, right there in verse 6, uh, such as the honor due to a father. A son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where's my honor? God's saying, I'm not getting it, right? If I am a master, where's my respect, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? They don't realize they're doing it. You know, fathers ought to be important to their kids. And so often we can look around and we can say, well, you know, we don't have ideal examples, but we know what it ought to be like. Right? I mean, even if we're not doing it ourselves, and, and, and we, we come from a, a family that's not functioning ideally, we know kids ought to look up to their dads. 
Kids ought to respect their dads. Child knows who provides for it. Child knows where safety and security ought to come from. Child knows who teaches them and mentors them, right? There ought to be that honor to, you know, my dad, followed by a statement, you know, because we ought to honor our dads. So my dad's bigger than your dad. My dad can handle this. My dad, you know, dad can do anything. And there ought to be that kind of honor and fear due to a master. That kind of honor. Romans 10, 13, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so we say, I'm a Christian. I'm one who calls on the name of the Lord. Well, calling on the name of the Lord infers that you recognize you're helpless and your need and your desperation, and you recognize His power and His authority. And so you make an appeal to Him for help. And so you enter a covenant relationship with Him, and you surrender yourself to Him for his help, and he becomes Lord. You call on him to be your Lord for safety and protection. Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.12, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. I have given my very soul into his care. I am his servant. He is my Lord and master. Folks call him Lord because they appeal to him for protection. To call him Lord is to call him king. That means we're his servants. Being his servants ought to mean we have that reverent fear and that we look to do whatever he says do. We are seeking to please him. If I call him Lord, then he's boss with a capital B. I mean the boss. And it might be that we serve out of fear until we really get to know him, then we serve out of love. And we do his will because we come to understand him and we desire to serve him and to have him find pleasure in us. That's the ideal, that's the goal, that's what we're looking for. 1 John 4 verse 18, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. The one who fears is not perfected in love. And so, if I am a father, where's my honor? If I'm a master, where's my respect? Some translations say, where's that fear? Fear we're talking about, that respect amounts to a worshipful submission, a reverential awe. There's my Lord and master, and an obedient respect. Now, if we lose that kind of respect, that kind of fear, means we don't realize who he really is and his relationship to us and our relationship to him. Maybe we've never really seen it, or maybe somehow we've lost that and forgotten that, and we need to get that back. We're talking about an honor here that leaves no room for any sprinklings of contempt. And some of those things, maybe they didn't realize they were doing it. Maybe we don't realize it. You know, you, you, you see so much of it everywhere as you look, especially on TV, don't you? I mean, folks laughing at religion and folks laughing at godliness. And, uh, you know, I used to say it all the time when I was back in college. You know, see you at church. Ha, 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 ha. Right? I mean, a big joke because, you know, nobody ever goes to church. You know, that sort of thing. But, or we use the Lord's name in vain. You know, we speak of him without really a reverential awe. And we use his name like a cuss word or something. We forget to give thanks. Or maybe it's something, maybe not that dire and drastic, but maybe you and I, maybe we just flat forget to ask God's advice and we make life choices and life decisions without praying about it first. You know, we ought to have that reverential fear. So if folks who really know God, if we are folks who know God and seek after him, the second point that I see in this passage, 
that there ought to be that kind of honor, that kind of reverential awe, that kind of esteem. There ought to be that reflected in the gifts we give. The gifts that we give to God, the things we set aside in sacrifice, they ought to demonstrate a heart that is focused on God and gives that kind of honor. And so verse 7, he says, you're presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? And that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. You know, we got to make some transitions here because they're bringing in animals to sacrifice. We do life sacrifices, living sacrifices. I am to be a live, living sacrifice. What nature of sacrifice, a gift, am I giving? You know, maybe it's the financial contribution. Maybe it's what I do Monday morning or Wednesday morning when I get out of bed. You know, and so it's not what we're putting on a physical altar in the temple in Jerusalem. It's what we're offering to God and how we view the unity and the fellowship and the, the common meal with God. So the defiled food. Some translations will say food, some will say meat, some will say bread. It is that which you're presenting. It's the gifts being offered. And so here are folks in Malachi 1 who are going through religious sacrifices, religious actions and activities as a duty. Whew, got that done. Took care of that chore. Now I can get on about my own business. They're doing it in that manner rather than from the heart. So there's an appearance of a dedication, a devotion. They are outwardly compliant. They're taking care of their chores as quick and easy as they possibly can. And inwardly, mentally, heartfelt, they're either absent or rebellious. Man, I hate doing this, but I got to do it. I guess I'll go do it, take care of it, and get done, and go on about my business. And so where's the heart? God cares about the focus of the spirit and the soul. You know, he explains that in Matthew 5 and 6. He talks about, you know, uh, you've heard it said in the law, thou shalt not do thus and such. But I say to you, if you've done it in your heart, you've done it already. Even if you haven't fulfilled the deed, you're actually, your soul and your spirit is defiled. You are dirty, even though you didn't do it, because your heart is wrong, your soul is wrong. Now, there's an old saying that, I've heard many times that, you know, somebody gets married and you say, well, you know, you can take away his freedom, but you can't take away his eyes. That means you can look all you want as long as you don't touch. That's wrong. Jesus would not agree to that for a second. Because if you're looking with your eyes, how would you like it if your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend was looking at somebody else and desiring to be with them even if they didn't do it, it would hurt you, and it hurts God the same way. And he says your soul is defiled. You know, God sees. He feels that same way. And you might be able to hide it from humans, but you can't hide it from God. He knows. So verse 8, when you present the blind for sacrifice, is that not evil? When you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Would you receive, would he receive you kindly? Says the Lord of hosts, you know. So here, here's a picture of folks offering their junk, their discards. You know, you, you wouldn't give your junk to somebody you're really trying to please. What would you give to somebody you're trying to impress with how much you honor them how much you esteem them. You'd give them the very best you could come up with. So I got this lamb that's crippled. And, you know, he's not very good for breeding. He's not much good for me at all. So I'll give him the Lord. No, he wants your absolute very best to show that honor. And we need to do the same thing with our sacrifices and our works and our efforts. You know, that widow's might. Them two little pennies or one little penny, that, that, that coin that's worth a half a penny, that'd be junk to a wealthy person. That's nothing. But it was significant to God when the widow put that in the plate. 
because it was all she had to live on. So it was, you know, so, you know, so it's, it's not, it's not the, the cost of the gift that you give. Maybe it's the cost to you of the gift that you give, right? And so, you know, what the, the, your mom doesn't want $100 from you. She'd rather get a card from the dollar store where you've taken time to write some heartfelt thoughts that really relate to her. That's what God's saying here. I want your thoughts. I want your heart. I want your focus. It's the effort involved. Our gifts ought to demonstrate an entreaty. An entreaty is an asking. If I want somebody to help me, I don't give them junk. If I'm making an appeal to God to help me, I'm going to give him my best. So verse 9, but now will you not entreat, there's that word, God's favor, that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? No, not with that stuff you're giving him. We need to look at what we're giving to God. And I'm not criticizing anybody for what you're given because I don't know what you're given. It's between you and God. I'm saying let's take a look at it and make sure it's our best. Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you'll not despise. Isaiah 66, 2. To this one I will look to him who is humble and contrite of spirit who trembles at my word. You see that reverential awe involved in the heart there? You know, worthless gifts are better if you don't give them. Verse 10. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. You know, it's better to not give junk. Don't give anything if you're going to give junk. D don't give something that will despise or demonstrate your lack of love. To sit in church and pretend to worship, you know, giving of time and attention, it, it, God, God looks for genuineness of it. You know, if you're sitting here grumbling, complaining, you might better have stayed home, right? You know, perhaps... Somebody could not come to church. They could remain home. They could be silent and obscure. And perhaps they could hide their despicable contempt for the Lord's table and his fellowship. So don't give a gift if it's going to be a rotten one. Uh, but God probably knows anyhow, so that's not the answer. The answer is examine your heart and give the best, you see. You know, how would you feel towards somebody who always gave you their cast-offs, their rejects, their throwaways? things they're never used anyway. You know, this sweater, this jacket is ready to be thrown away. Let's give it to the king. Matthew 25, verse 4. Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. You ever thought of buying something really good for the poor instead of just giving them your old clothes? Go out and do something special. You know, when you give a gift, whether it's a donation, a contribution, an action, a deed, uh, we need to think about who we're doing it for and why. Are you doing it just to look good? Are you doing it because you've got to do something? Or are you doing it as an honor to Almighty God the Father, and I don't care who else in the world sees it, if nobody sees it, this is my honor to God. Lack of love and honor for God shows up in the communion service. And part of what I'm understanding from this section is that we ought to honor the privilege of sharing in the Lord's table. Our honor to God is evident in the Lord's table. Who set this up? God did. Christ did. Malachi 1.12 you are profaning it in that you say, the table of the Lord is defiled. As for its fruit, its food is to be despised. I don't like this stuff, in other words. What am I doing here? I don't want to eat that. I don't want to share in that. You also say, how tiresome it is. And you disdainfully sniff at it. 
You get the picture of that? Isn't that rude? I don't want none of that. I don't want none of that. I mean, that's, that's an ugly picture. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, so you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? Imagine sniffing. Imagine sitting down to dinner with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. That's what this is an image of, right? And he has invited us to fellowship with him, and I sniff at it. What is that anyway? <laughs> you know, is that any good? I don't know if I want to eat that stuff. I see that sometimes when I talk with folks. Talk about going to church. Talk about sitting down and having a Bible study. Talk about a devotional. Well, maybe. I don't have anything better to do. Hey, you want to come over to dinner next Friday? Well, John, uh, I ain't got anything better to do. I guess I can. I mean, that's kind of a, that's kind of a rotten thing to say to somebody, isn't it? Uh, you know, I don't have a golf date. Nothing good on TV. Seen those reruns 60 times. I guess I'll come to dinner with you. That's the attitude that these devoutly religious people are presenting to God in Malachi chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? You know, there's a presence of God in this communion service. There's an expression beyond that. There is an actual fellowship with the creator of all things. There is a joining in with the Savior of your soul. How could you miss being present for that when you know that God himself is present and participating? How could anybody despise that invitation? And we're not just talking about being there for the communion service. We're talking about all opportunities at fellowship with Almighty God. You know, honoring God is evident in fellowship activities. How can one who loves God with all their heart feel toward missing the assembly with other Christians in whom God dwells? Man, there's a chance to get together with folks, to gather, to encourage, to strengthen, to teach, to learn, to inspire others to love and to do God-honoring deeds to help folks that are weak. Is that a bother? Is that a chore to grudgingly participate in? Or is that something to get excited about and glorify God in? What a privilege. Wouldn't miss it. That's the attitude we need to have. God is worthy of honor. God will be honored. Philippians 2, verse 9. For this reason also God highly exalted him, Christ, and bestowed upon him, Christ, the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He will be great. He will be highly esteemed. And so verse 14, but cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it, the sacrifice is a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. So I got this good stuff that I could give. I got this perfect animal, and I promised God my very best. When I was immersed in the water, I called him Lord, and I called upon him. I promised him my very best. And then I look around and I say, man, I don't want to give the best that I got. I got this blemished one over here. And that'll be a gift. That'll be a sacrifice. So I'll have my duty performed. It ain't going to work. God forbid that anyone should think of swindling the Lord. God forbid that I should ever be found to be swindling the Lord by half-hearted devotion. God is great. And so the urging this morning is to honor God as a father. Give him the reverence due as a master. 
Give good gifts. Honor that fellowship union with him in his presence. Resolve to genuinely honor God with all of our lives. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Almighty God, for watching out over us, for providing counsel and leadership. Put your spirit upon us and enable us, help us to check ourselves and make sure that we are genuine in our devotion to you. In the name of Christ, amen. I hope this message this morning has been an encouragement. It has been intended to be that rather than a criticism of any sort. Uh, but maybe it has caused you to think. And maybe it has brought some conviction to your heart. If there is any way we can assist you, encourage you, strengthen you, enable you to a pure devotion, now is the time to ask for those prayers, and now is the time for us to join hands and hearts together in prayer. Jeff's going to lead us in a song, and then we'll have opportunity to pray about things. Thank you.